So here it is. Reprogramming the soul component towards the primordial man. If the abductee's soul component comes from primordial man, she usually feels some nostalgia for her first physical body container, which is at times deified as the father or the owner or the creator. Soul desires to go back to it as soon as possible and she often time remembers that she's been abandoned here and she lives waiting for the primordial man to come back to take her again. The soul shows a complete unawariness for what actually happened, and she wrongly believes she must wait for the primordial man to come back. But we know that things are really different than this. We know that the primordial man has blocked within itself its soul component in order to make its physical body container immortal but also blocking the ability for the soul to experience because she cannot experience the only thing for which she has come to this universe, meaning experiencing death. The primordial man doesn't want to die and it behaves towards soul exactly in the same way as the other aliens do, since they crave for the soul to be blocked in their physical body containers so that they can be immortal even if they prevent soul and all conscience to experience. The primordial man uses a trick to solve this problem. It has taken its soul components and it has shared them with the men's physical body containers so that soul could experience death using the human physical body containers. But it seems that at the end of this experience, the soul wanted to go back to her original owner, the primordial man, who put her in a cage forever. Soul is still here with us because she has been abandoned by the primordial man and she is totally unaware that she's been used and exploited by her future jailers. When we remind to soul in this module about her role in this matter, she shows anger against the primordial man and she doesn't want to go back to it anymore. Through this realization, we try to let the soul component understand that the weird all man who seems an old wise man that's the way the mind sees it, who appears at times during the SIMBID practice by the freed abductees, and who wants to convince the soul to go back to him. It is actually a smart human lair who wants to cage soul after she has experienced death. Using her in this context and having her being abducted oftentimes by the aliens and using her as a Rojan horse during the alien abductions. The primordial man uses also mankind as cannon fodder, causing the human race extermination every thousands of years in order to avoid that the soul component gets to be taken by the aliens and to avoid that mankind obtains self-consciousness and realizes the way things are. As we already said in a different venue, mankind has no advocate, neither alien nor the human military, and not even the primordial man who created the aliens, which built us afterwards so that they could through us become just like primordial man. The primordial man itself somehow committed our sin, wanting to become immortal and maybe eternal just like its first creator. We deprogram the soul via this last module from following the primordial man, and we gift her the opportunity to be free and to choose her own future. I figure there will always be humans to feed off of for these beings as long as we do not wake up or cling to beliefs and behaviors which make us vulnerable to this type of manipulation. Personally, I think waking up can take years or perhaps lifetimes. Many people and experiencers of alien encounters do not want to believe that they could be used as a battery for these beings or deceive. It creates too much cognitive dissonance and would necessitate being willing to face parts of themselves that are afraid. 
It takes a lot of courage and personal responsibility to deal with this level of spiritual warfare. It has taken me decades of research, painful experiences, counseling, and meditation practice to start becoming more aware. Lots of healing work and facing fears and rejection. But I've met some wonderful people along the way, and it has been worth it. Awareness is not always pleasant and can be shocking. Not all love and light bliss, so to speak. We have to step out of the victimized state of mind and get rid of the fear. This is the only way to get the respect of these creatures and develop a communication of some sort. Whining and unnecessary complaining are the dead end. Then we start to dig our own psychological and physical grave for sure. Objectivity and courage is needed even to try to understand a different kind of intelligence and technology. This is something we are not able to do. The researchers who only feed the fear instead of objectivity are no better than the New Age people who are proclaiming easy ascension and waiting for spiritual enlightenment even while being roasted in the oven. Archons Rents Many people have heard the term archon, but would be hard-pressed to define it. What is an archon? Widener to begin with, I would draw attention to two articles on your site. The Global Coup Dedat and the one about ownership of the world. The Queen of England owns one-sixth of the non-ocean surface of the world. And keep that in mind as we go into the Archon subject. The Archons were whispered about in texts after the burning of the library at Alexandra with some mention of mysterious beings called Archons. But the powers that be spent 1,300 years cleaning up the records and had written out the Archons from our history. In 1947, texts were found in clay jars in Nag Hammadi in Egypt and on these texts was a story of what the Nag Hammadi people, 2,000 years ago, thought the world was about. The reason the Nag Hammadi texts, which date back 2,100 years, 100 BC, are so important is that no one has been able to put a spin on it. The texts have not been altered, destroyed, or omitted as in the Bible. No one has been able to distort or destroy them, which is what they'd really like to do to keep the information and knowledge from the masses. Luckily, they survived, were successfully translated, and when many people read them, they found a clear and defined discussion of what these archons are. The texts had been buried in a deep cave in Egypt in order to protect the most important information that they had. Rents. There are 13 codices containing over 50 texts, which is quite a substantial amount of writing. Widener. A highly descriptive document of an entirely different world from the one we know. People don't realize that, 2,000 years ago, there was a religion on this planet called Gnosticism, which was the biggest religion on earth at the time, was vying with Hinduism. You could go take a university course on the history of religions now and wouldn't even find a mention of Gnosticism. The Nag Hammadi texts provide a description for what the Gnostics believe. Gnostic is a Greek word meaning knowledge noses. The Gnostics believe that liberation can only be achieved by knowledge, by the consumption and evaluation of reality through knowledge. The library at Alexandria was run by Gnostics and they were the first people to collect scrolls and books and assemble this information. Their culture spread throughout Europe and the Middle East. 
This was long before the advent of the Western religions outside of Judaism, which was mostly concentrated in Israel. Gnostics preached that there was an invasion that occurred about 3600 BC and about 1600 years before the Nag Hammadi texts were buried. They wrote that this invasion was like a virus and in fact, they were hard pressed to describe it. The beings that were invading were called Darchins. These Archons had the ability to duplicate reality, to fool us. They were jealous of us because we have an essence of some kind, a soul, that they don't possess, and the Nag Hammadi texts describe the Archons. One looks like a reptile, and the other looks like an unformed baby or a photos. It is partially living and partially non-living and has gray skin and dark, unmoving eyes. The Archons are duplicating reality so that when we buy into it, when we come to believe that the duplicated, false state reality is the real reality, then they become the victors. The Archons came to Adam. When they saw Eve talking to him, they said to each other, what sort of creature is this luminous woman? Now come, let us lay hold of her and cast our seed into her, that she may become soiled and unable to access her inner light. Then those who she bears will be under our charge. But Eve, being a free power, laughed at their decision. She put mist in their eyes and escaped them. Yes, it would seem that we are dealing with cosmic criminals here. The striking part is that all these things are also found in them. A thief has crept in our house unawares while we are sleeping. The thief has scoped the house out for quite some time, even generations taking note of our most valuable possessions. Our library collection is targeted as is our water supply. The thief's ultimate prize is the living waters inside the house. The library contains knowledge fit for our king, a powerful king who has legions of armies at his command. The water supply keeps the dweller healthy and alive, unless of course, it becomes contaminated and eventually shut off for damned up for the robber's hijacking operation. The robbers infect the library with counterfeit doctrines, so that confusion reigns and the dweller forgets that he is the son of a great king. In fact, he believes that kings and queens are a thing of the past, even blasphemous. After all, one of his counterfeit books stole him so. Furthermore, when the dweller awoke from time to time from a nightmare about getting his house ransacked, he disregarded the dream with trendy psycho babble, or perhaps that pizza he ate last night. The thief is laughing his head off because the dweller's house has now been thoroughly bugged. The robber is a professional liar and hit man. He won't trance at the house all at once. Instead, he will secure his target while he is sleeping, lock into place his implants and siphoning devices, then sit back and allow his sleeping target to produce purified water for him. Why? Because the thief polluted his own water supply by damming it up until it became completely contaminated and unfit for life. As long as the dweller remains asleep, confused and locked into place, the thief has complete control over him. Even if the dweller awakens, he realizes he is in occupied territory of the enemy. Resistance is met with severe punishment. Unless, of course, the dweller cleans out his library, studies his true king's history and realizes his inheritance. 
Sometimes our parable is the best method to get our point across. At the same time, once we awaken to the reality of being in enemy-occupied territory, we need assistance in reclaiming our own waters of life. One point I'd like to get across is that today, many of our own people, even believers, have been born into occupied territory because the enemy and his pawns have exchanged the truth for a life for such a long time. The people in occupied territory do not even know their true history or the state of bondage they are in. Their condition of ignorance is so great they do not realize there is a better world outside of their drug lord-occupied neighborhood. Entire doctrines and belief systems have been created to explain and justify the quality of life in the hood. Doctrines replete with necessary suffering, powerlessness, separation from God, and the notion that true love is an illusion. And so on and so forth. Becoming free from the clutches of the drug lords is our step-by-step -step process that can be achieved even in the worst of neighborhoods. The strategy of becoming a free king and queen is still within our grasp as long as we stay a human connected to our true life source, God. See you soon on the next episode.